Okay, this is the Linux Fest, so we want to get this thing started here. Um, all right, uh, first I want to do a couple of acknowledgments. Um, thanks to the uh, OLF 2023 for uh, presenting us this year. Um, uh, we want, we're very appreciative for the opportunity to be here and um, uh, make this presentation uh, before you. Uh, thanks to Vance uh, for all the technical support and all the extra effort um, and all of the back and forth and you know and everything he did to uh, help us uh, pull this presentation off. I also want to thank, give a, a, a shout out to uh, George Mason University and the uh, uh, library research specialist there, uh, Trevor Watkins, uh, and helping us uh, and sponsoring us with this Zoom connection. Um, they, they're making this uh, Zoom opportunity uh, possible. And we want to give a uh, uh, thanks uh, to our, our sponsor, CTES Laboratories. Uh, that's where we do most of our uh, daytime work. And they're uh, very good at uh, sponsoring us. And they provide a lot of support for our efforts, um, our side efforts, to uh, promote uh, citizen science. Uh, we believe a lot in that, and, and so uh, at CTES Laboratories has been very supportive in, in any kind of effort and endeavor um, that we've uh, uh, decided to pursue in that regard. So uh, we're, we're fortunate, and uh, so we thank our sponsors here. And also we want to let you know, um, here's the URL um, uh, on this slide for uh, this video. Um, it's it's going to be on YouTube, so you'll be able to assess to access it from the uh, YouTube page, and uh, it'll be uh, available for a, a link from uh, uh, Linux Fest 2023 as well. Um, and so you will be able to access this. So for those of you that are can hear the Zoom, and you don't uh, know where we are, uh, you're, you're not able to actually uh, be here today, or or um, um, you're, you're off-site for whatever reason, you, you, you couldn't attend the conference, uh, you'll be able to access this video. As well, we've provided a, a URL for um, supporting videos, um, you know, uh, videos related to the material that we're going to be presented today. Um, we're we're going to do like a 45 or 50 minute talk, and this talk's got a lot in it. And, and so uh, there's going to need to, there will be a need to... Um, follow up on some of the material and check some of the references and uh, you may need to come back to it again um, and so there are other videos that support uh, some of the some of the more um, involved concepts that we're going to talk about so uh, uh, please take advantage of those and and be aware of those uh, here um, and uh, at, at CTES Laboratories, uh, Tracy and I, um, our, our primary function is uh, computational epistemology and epistemic visualization. Uh, and those are big words for um, we, we, we focus on methods of uh, putting knowledge inside of uh, uh, computer programs, getting knowledge inside of a computer. Not just data and information, but how do we get knowledge? Um, how do we represent the knowledge? Um, our main focus is on coming up with methods and algorithms, um, discrete structures and data structures, and, and then different um, computational um, approaches to storing knowledge, um, retrieving knowledge, uh, and finding knowledge in, in, a, in a computational uh, context. And so that's kind of uh, what Tracy and I do. And when we are not um, largely focused on that, uh, we, we, we have a lot of volunteer efforts with uh, citizen science in, in our neighborhood. We're in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and so on. We work uh, very uh, closely with the uh, Oak Hill Collaborative Makerspace there, um, and we do volunteer uh, uh, work there, volunteer uh, teaching engineering to um, any of the... Um, the citizens uh, uh, and uh, folks that live in the neighborhood, young and old. Um, we support a lot of citizen science efforts. We are engaged in a lot of uh, local um, lake and uh, water testing, um, watershed testing and that kind of thing. 
um, environmental monitoring. That's the kind of stuff that we do for the citizen science at, uh, eff effort and support at, at CTES Labs. And so this talk is is kind of coming from that uh, that uh, area. So that's that's uh, enough. You can take a look at check us out on CTES Labs. Dot org if you want to find out more about the kind of projects that we are we are both engaged in, or if you're you know, trying to get in touch touch with us, I believe you can get our emails directly from that site. Okay, now as far as uh, the matrix of you know we try to um, score our videos in a way that will. Um, that will let the people in the audience know what to expect and, and whether it's the, the talk that you're getting ready to hear right now, whether it's it's too easy for you and it's too uh, at a low level and then maybe you're already beyond this point or whether it's, you know, you, you, maybe it's not something you're interested in or, or maybe it's the material might be too advanced for you. So we try to get, you know, come up with a matrix and to give you some idea of uh, the uh, the level of knowledge that the audience needs to participate in this, um, so at, at on the Linux level, we're really talking about just beginning level uh, Linux stuff. Nothing really uh, fancy there. Uh, the same thing with the Arduino. If you um, uh, know basic wiring with the Arduino and you're kind of familiar with with uh, the uh, Arduino uh, environment, you know th th there won't be any surprises here. Um, Raspberry Pi, the same thing there. Um, and we put intermediate here because we talk about the GPIO pins a little. Um, and so we realize there's some people who use a Raspberry Pi and they don't get into the pin programming at all. And so, you know, that might be considered an intermediate. And then there's some folks that use the, the Raspberry Pi and that's all they do is, is the GPIO pins. And so for them, some of this may be beginning. C++. Um, and that is primarily the language that we use um, um, at CTES too, as, as well, and, and, and in our in all of our efforts. Um, this is intermediate level stuff. Um, we will at least talk about how implementing implementing certain kinds of uh, member functions. Um, but if you know basic C plus plus, you'll you'll be able to, to follow and sing along, right? Um, uh, Prolog is beginning knowledge. Uh, for those of you who know, who know who Prolog is, know what Prolog is, that's a programming language where logic programming techniques are used. Um, you can, you know, if you're familiar with GNU Prolog or uh, uh, Switch Prolog out of Amsterdam, uh, you'll be very familiar with this as very beginning stuff. Um, and the knowledge uh, representation and reasoning aspect that we talk about is just beginners. And the same thing with descriptive logics. So this is a lot, and uh, some of it could be dense, um, you know, the stuff that's not uh, beginning, and, and not everybody will necessarily get this the first time through. So fortunately, it's on video, and so you'll be able to, um, you know, rewind, stop, pause, go back to it, and, you know, get yourself a, a drink and <laughs> come back to it at a later time. Uh, so, so good to on video. And now, you know, for who this is for, we, we kind of see this, this, this talk is for five people, five different, there are five different categories of people. And you know, you're going to have to select to see which one of those uh, categories you're in. Um, so category one, um, if you are a Linux, Arduino, or a Pi programmer with just way too much time on your hand, uh, then this talk is probably for you. Okay. Um, also, uh, category two, if you are a sci-fi hacker who has been secretly developing your own private thinking machine and you're missing just a few pieces of information, you know, something you can't just quite get there, uh, this, talk is, uh, this talk could be for you. Um, if you are an AI researcher out there and you're just a tad bit suspicious about all of this uh, chat GPT um, stuff. Uh, this talk could definitely be for you. That's that's. There's no question about that. Um, and uh, if you've um, now, if you're in category four, and you've had no other session to go to this morning, and you got caught up by the clickbait title of this talk, right? 
for you, uh, this should be a wild ride, you know, and uh, hold on, right? And the last category we have, uh, if you believe you are the last Jedi or the Quisac Hatterack or you're the chosen one and you feel no one understands your strange Arduino Pi Linux creations, then this talk is definitely for you. And uh, maybe you should drop us an email at CTS Labs at your earliest convenience. Now, um, if you don't feel like you're in any of these categories, right, and you manage to survive to the end of the talk, um, then drop us a note in the comments and uh, let us know what you thought and let us know what categories we should add in the future uh, when we uh, when we make this talk. And the title of this the title of this talk is. Um, Arduino meets Raspberry Pi, um, old programming techniques for knowledge embedded systems. And old is an acronym, and we'll, we'll get into that. That's kind of like a double entendre, because some of the techniques we are talking about are really true and tried, and they've been around um, in the thinking machines um, uh, community for some time. But some of it is state-of-the-art stuff, too. So old is kind of a just a play on uh, terms here. Um, and uh, here's a, here's another uh, important point that we don't we don't want to leave out. Um, we um, as far as our, as far as the term artificial intelligence, this is a disclaimer here. Uh, the AI the AI is being hyped. That term and the and the abbreviation AI has been hyped and applied to so many technologies in so many different ways with so many vague expectations and so many uh, just weird notions with so many contradictory and undefined features that we really don't even know what the phrase artificial intelligence even means anymore. Um, and uh, AI, we, we just, we can't put our finger, we can't put our finger in it anymore, so we just don't use it. And so um, it, we won't talk about it beyond this, this slide. Okay, so um, you you may be as you're listening to our talk, uh, uh, placing this in various AI categories, and you're welcome to do it. We're just letting you know that uh, we won't be using the the acronym, um, the the abbreviation or the term artificial intelligence uh, for the rest of the slide. That's just kind of like a uh, this is just a disclaimer, just so we won't you know fray any expectations here. Also. This is only old programming techniques. There will be no discussion of chat GPT. For, so for those of you that are looking for that kind of thing, uh, it's not going to be here. Uh, won't be any uh, talk about uh, machine learning or deep learning or large language models. Uh, all of those of you out there that are looking for the latest and greatest and you know web programming, we're sorry. We, you know, there's no none of that going on. No Rust, no Node.js, none of those things. Uh, this is this talk is really going to be just focused on embedded type programming, microcontroller, um, Raspberry Pi level stuff, um, and and that's that's the gist of it, right? And so if you're looking for that other kind of stuff. Um, this probably is not your talk, right? Um, and so we've got embedded devices, you know, and, and what those are, and, and we've got this Arduino and Raspberry Pi combo, and we, we're developing these devices, and the point of these devices is to do um, uh, environmental monitoring. And, and we're, we're really talking about um, home-level, do-it-yourself environmental monitoring. And, uh, of course, a lot of these devices... Um, at least not not the thinking versions you you can get simpler versions you know off of Amazon for forty or fifty dollars so you know it's not like this is some kind of breakthrough technology this is for those you know those hackers and those tinkerers and those programmers that want to make their own and you know they've got the time uh, to do that and they want to make something that that um, is is knowledge based and and that will uh, give them a little more bang for the buck and you know it's just uh, interesting programming uh, for them and so the kind of monitoring we're doing and and making uh, autonomous devices for um, it might monitor things like carbon monoxide or other dangerous exhausts that could be in your home you know you know maybe you, maybe you got a soldering bench 
and you know and you don't realize you know you know uh, you know how much of that solder has gotten into the air uh, and, and and so y your system is going to let you know that um, fire smoke alarms all kind of things for indoor uh, environment also outdoor uh, monitoring you know any kind of like monitoring your lawn your garden those kind of things uh, the soil soil monitoring checking uh, salinity and conductivity uh, pH nitrate levels all that kind of stuff um, and you know if you need a, uh, a an autonomous embedded device that, that helps you uh, monitor you know maybe you've got a small farm or you know small garden or something that you're, you're trying to uh, monitor keep the flowers growing something like that um, uh, we, we give you ideas and an approach to do this uh, and build a system on your own um, that, that has a that has some uh, heft to it also um, we're, like we're into the local lake uh, watershed testing testing for har uh, harmful algae bloom like if you were to go to our site you would see some of the underground robotics underwater robots that we use uh, we have sensors and cameras uh, attached to those things and you know we have smart devices that we've designed um, to be a part of those that help us do water you know monitoring of like park lakes and recreational lakes in the uh, Northeast Ohio like like for instance um, we have a Mill Creek um, Park Lake project where we're working on doing a, a video survey a underwater video survey of uh, some of the Mill Creek Park lakes like uh, Lake Newport, Lake Dozier, Lake Glacier, you know, uh, some of those different lakes. So these are all environmental monitoring devices that you can build using a combination of Arduino and uh, Raspberry Pi and some of the techniques, the old programming techniques that we're going to talk about today um, and give you an overview today. Uh, if you apply those, you, you'll come up with something um, that'll give you monitoring um, ability, uh, autonomous monitoring ability, but this has uh, way more functionality than something you might buy on uh, Amazon, right? Um, and so, for those of you that are the do-it-do-it-yourself types, or you know, folks with some of those those Arduino and Raspberry Pi programmers that have way too much time on their hand, you know, here are a couple uh, good book re uh, references. They have some real easy and interesting projects in them. Um, they're, they're pretty expen un inexpensive from what I remember. Um, you know, they're like under 10 bucks, you know, these things. And so if you were looking for ideas for environmental monitoring um, and uh, little projects uh, with examples and uh, that kind of thing, these are good starter type things, you know, stuff that it like... Will, will, will kind of inspire your your imagination uh, with respect to atmospheric monitoring or environmental monitoring and and I recommend them I have them I've used them I, I use them in classes uh, you know they're, they're good books for what they are and for the cost you really can't beat it beat them uh, you're done by O'Reilly and Maker Press so this is good stuff um, and so for those of you that are interested in this kind of thing um, you know this is a good place to start right um, and so we have the Arduino and Raspberry Pi um, and the uh, Raspberry Pi OS, you know, it's like a trio here that, that uh, you know, a lot of times people just refer to the Pi and they're just thinking about the hardware, but boy, that Linux um, basis, uh, the Raspberry Pi OS is, is with all of the tools and utilities and access and availability and the applications that are, that are available in a Linux environment, they just, it's just, it's a, it's a powerhouse in its, in its own right. And so we use these three things um, together. First of all, um, there are things that we need to do uh, as far as sensors and dedicated effectors and actuators that the, that the Arduino is best for, right? That's what it, 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 it has the ports, it has the, the pins, it, it, you know, it's, it's designed uh, real well for that. It has the price point for that, it's a nice little microcontroller. Um, and so we have dedicated things that we do on the uh, Arduino. And then the Raspberry Pi just has way more capability at a higher level. Having that um, 
ability to um, attach external storage and you know uh, you know um, HDMI monitors or wh whatever it is that you we might want to attach to it the Arduino brings that uh, the Raspberry Pi brings that bigger thing and then we have the entire um, Linux environment with with the uh, free and open source software that just allows us to uh, do things that from a citizen science level um, um, and it just brings down the cost and makes it accessible to people that need to uh, do this kind of stuff uh, and, or that want to do this kind of stuff. So the Arduino and Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry OS for us, it's a nice trio for a lot of reasons. Um, some of them, um, beyond those I just mentioned, are just the sensors that, that are available. If you're doing monitoring type and measurement type work, the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, they are your friends. Uh, you can find a whole bunch of sensors and, and, you know, in, a, in a wide uh, uh, range of application areas that are just readily available for both the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. Um, any the, the ultrasonic sensors, uh, connectivity sensors, uh, magnetic sensors, tilt, gyroscopes, communications, soil, um, oxygen, just just about anything that you want to get at um, in, in terms of home, uh, you know, uh, do-it-yourself environmental monitoring. Uh, there's there's a, a Raspberry Pi or Arduino sensor out there for you. And if not, a combination of those sensors uh, can give you a uh, a little bit even more uh, functionality. So as a wide sensor array, these things are also very um, affordable. You know, you get packs of them for, in some cases, under $100, you know. Uh, so so that was another reason why we went to Arduino and Raspberry Pi to build our embedded devices because the uh, availability of sensors is just rich. And um, folks that know a lot about sensors, are, are part of the Arduino and Raspberry Pi, Pi community, and so uh, for those of us that need help with that kind of thing, there's plenty of folks out there that will help you and that are knowledgeable about that. And uh, and and also the folks at the um, the uh, uh, NIST, they also there are some folks behind the scenes there that that work with the Arduino and Raspberry Pi community. You know, the National Institutes of Science uh, Standards and Technology. Those, those folks, they have some good people there. Um, yeah, and as a matter of fact, in any of the the uh, seventeen national labs, at least the ones we work with, there are people that will work with you behind the scenes on some of those, and they work with your school and, and that kind of thing. So anyway, sensors was a big thing um, for the Arduino. That Arduino uh, programming environment was also a big reason um, why we picked that. It, it makes uh, 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 programming uh, these microcontrollers. It makes it. Uh, Put, makes it very accessible, a lot more accessible, and a lot more open than some other environments. I won't mention uh, names. Um, and the support that Arduino has for C++ and object-oriented programming. Um, and make no mistake about this, um, the, the programming environment for Arduino is a subset of C++. There are obviously, because it's a microcontroller, there are obviously things that you can't bring the full um, uh, class libraries, set of class libraries in, and the, you know the, the the full set of um, memory management and those kinds of things in. But it's a it's a, a legitimate subset of C plus plus. It's not some strange variant of C. I, I hear that a lot of times. People think that the Arduino is some kind of a C because uh, when they log into when they you know boot up the uh, environment, all they see is a setup and a loop function, and you know they don't really see. Uh, the C++ they're used to, um, but those functions are really just convenient um, candy uh, functions, sugar functions out there to, to make things easier. Uh, there's a main line and there's, you know, you can, you can get at regular C++ in the uh, Arduino environment. So it has full support, or at least as much of the support for object-oriented programming uh, that we need. And um, in the object-oriented programming that we use, uh, we implement, we implement a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, procedural and declarative uh, knowledge techniques using that. So the Arduino uh, environment is perfect for us uh, in terms of the microcontroller uh, programming. And uh, so that was a big thing. And then the Raspberry Pi, you just can't 
beat this thing uh, with all of the capabilities, the Ethernet capability, USB access, the storage, the, the processor speed, you, you know, the HDMI, it's just, and it has the GPIO, these 40 GPIO pins that let you uh, program, I, you know, serial programming, I2C kind of programming, if you've, you've got the courage for that. Uh, it, it, it just, it's a, just a wealth for people that are trying to do low-level programming that uh, you, you can't beat it. It's, you know, you, you know five-volt power, three-volt power, uh, you know, UART kind of programming. Uh, you got the clocks that you have. It's just, you know, for people who are doing microcontroller, microcomputer, pocket mobile microcomputer or computing kind of applications, um, the Raspberry Pi is like, and it's Linux-based, it's just a powerhouse. Um, and so that's also the, the camera, you know, like we... In a lot of our applications, we have a, a camera uh, a component. We're running OpenCV on there uh, for object recognition. Um, it's, it's just you know a powerhouse, right? So you couple this with the Arduino and Raspberry Pi OS, and you really have something to work with. Um, okay, so let's get right quick here. We're going to talk about this old uh, architecture, and this is we're just giving like a simple overview right here. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're just kind of giving a logical view of a, of a, a knowledge-based embedded device. And, and, and keep in mind that these embedded devices are, are used in physical computing most of the time. And, 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 I, and I, I guess I want to distinguish physical computing from like desktop computing or, or web computing, you, you know what I mean, uh, uh, where... In the physical computing, you're using um, the device uh, in, in as a part of some other uh, process, you know, outside of a you know, say, a business application or something. Um, but that's a whole nother talk, um, a whole nother discussion in of itself. Uh, uh, let's just suffice it to say that we're talking about knowledge-based devices that are used primarily in physical computing, and in this case. The physical computing uh, application is uh, environmental monitoring. Now, for in our old architecture, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute here about what old means. Um, but in this old architecture, we it's an agent-based architecture. So um, we have two agents. We have one agent that runs on the Raspberry Pi, and we have one agent that runs on the Arduino. Um, the Arduino agent um, is... It's a, uh, it has uh, procedural knowledge about sensors, effectors, and actuators. Um, the Arduino agent has C++ models, um, detailed models of, spe of specific sensors, specific actuators, specific effect, uh, uh, effectors. So it's the device-specific knowledge that we model and that we run on the Arduino. Okay, so if I am using a, a particular, let's say, a HRSO4 ultrasonic sensor, um, then the, the, the model of that sensor, that specific sensor, has been implemented um, and is running in the Arduino environment. Okay, and on the Raspberry Pi, we also have a sensor agent there. And on that sensor agent, uh, we've, we, it has access to the knowledge base that we, we, we're kind of alluding to. Um, it has access to uh, algorithms that we call reasoners and inference. It also has high-level sensor models. And so what we mean by high-level sensor models, um, um, it may know how to interact with a, let's say, an ultrasonic sensor or a light sensor or a magnetic sensor in the, in the, at the high level, but it doesn't have any uh, knowledge about a particular ultrasonic sensor or a particular uh, conductivity sensor, right? And so that kind of knowledge is actually stored on the, in the class that's running on the Arduino. So if you look at it, um, the Raspberry Pi uh, agent has high level knowledge about sensors, effectors, and actuators, um, and it has models of those things. And uh, the Arduino has low level, detailed, device specific models of uh, 
uh, manufacture vendor specific models of those kind of things. And then we have the Raspberry Pi. So it's kind of a dual agent thing. One agent runs on the Raspberry Pi, one agent runs on the Arduino. The Raspberry Pi is more generic in, with respect to the hardware. Our Arduino is more specific um, uh, with respect to the hardware. Uh, so kind of keep this picture in mind as we're going. And the devices that we are running need both of these components, right? Well, you you know, for the, for the architecture that we're talking about, you can't just have a Raspberry Pi. I mean, you could just have a Raspberry Pi, but it's going to make your a lot of your programming harder, and you're going to be taxing those GPIO pins beyond what you need to. And so it just makes better sense to, um, dis, you know, uh, distribute that work. Okay. Um, and so what do we mean by, oh, this is an acronym. O, um, the O is for object-oriented programming. The L is for logic programming, and the D is for descriptive non, uh, logics. And um, we use those uh, three concepts to help us develop embedded knowledge-based agent-oriented systems that can think about the monitoring process. Okay, and that's and we and when we highlight think here, we really do mean that. Um, and we say old again because. As it's an acronym, but yeah, these concepts have been around. These are true, tried things, um, and they they aren't going anywhere. Um, and and for the work that we do, uh, these are the best um, techniques and approaches to architecture that we've been able to come up with. Um, and we've been at this for a few years now, um, and so we we stick with these things. And it's an approach to using Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. Um, we feel that will help you if you're trying to do this kind of work. It will help you be more, um, you'll get a better handle on your projects. You'll be able to uh, maintain them better, understand them better. Uh, you'll be able to apply them in more areas. Um, and so uh, C++ is the primary thing that we have going on. And then on the logic programming side, um, on the Raspberry Pi, we use, we use Switch uh, Prolog. That's what we call it. Uh, we've got a link here on the slide. Some of you may have never even heard of this before. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't even know what 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 uh, Wikipedia says about this language. I, I just know that in the logic community, it's a big deal, um, and and as far as we're concerned, it's state of the art in many ways. Uh, others may uh, see this as a a language from uh, uh, days gone by, um, but I assure you, it's alive and well. There's a GNU prologue. Um, but I, it, we didn't find it flexible enough to do what we were trying to do. Uh, and so we went with Switch Prolog, which is also a, a, an a open source uh, a technology. So anyway, the old programming techniques that we're talking about involve object-oriented programming, logic programming concepts, and descriptive logic programming concepts. And combining those things together, we're able to make these systems that can think about the monitoring process. And so what do we mean by think, right? That's that's a charge word, uh, and so at, at CTES Labs um, we kind of define it by a list of terms, right? So um, for us, it's these operations here: evaluating, calculating, computing, you know, analyzing, supposing, positing, deducing. It's those kinds of things. Notice we have some of these terms in red. These terms, although a part of thinking, we do not implement those, and so we we are we haven't been able to. Um, do pondering and innovating and wondering and imagining yet. Um, we'll, we'll save that for other uh, kinds of, uh, you know, ambitious software. But the other ones we do. And there we have very specific algorithms and procedures and programs and functions um, that implement these kinds of operations. Um, and, and so, and they are running on the uh, Raspberry Pi and on the Arduino. Right, so these are not things that require massive supercomputers running in the cloud and all this kind of stuff. We we don't have that going on. We we're talking about everything we're going to, we're talking about today um, actually executes right on the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi. And so these thinking operations are, are done. And and um, and there's a and we'll, we're going to give you references to this kind of programming at the end of this talk. Um, but this is all done with uh, epistemic and dosastic and deontic uh, temporal logic frameworks. Um, again, I wouldn't be bringing them up if we couldn't uh, implement this stuff in a, in a Raspberry Pi and Arduino environment. 
but we can. And so when we say thinking, uh, this is what we mean, um, and these are the kind of operations we're talking about. And now, um, we keep saying knowledge base. I want to I want to differentiate and just contrast a knowledge base to a database. So when we say knowledge base and knowledge based, you know, you can kind of picture what we're talking about. In a database, a database is typically going to just store, you know, a collection of data and information. That's that's what it does. And the kind of operations you get happening on a database, you know, you get selection and I'm I'm just using SQL, it's SQL here. You get selection operations, union, intersection, subtract you know, those kind of operations, you do that on the data and information that's stored in a database, and that's what happens. A knowledge base is a very different thing. Contrary to uh, some of the things you might see on the web where they show knowledge base just being a, 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 a collection of frequently asked questions, that's not what it is in our community, in the KRR community. Knowledge base is a very technical thing, and it's a set of propositions and it has a set of reasoner type operations. The operations that you do, where you do selection, union, and intersection on a, um, a database, on a, on a uh, knowledge base, you're gonna do assertion, deduction, abduction, induction, retraction, you know, logical type operations. So a knowledge base has a collection of propositions, and database has just data and information in it. Very different things, very different kind of processing. Um, and just for those of you who are trying to look ahead, the knowledge base runs on the Raspberry Pi. Um, and we also want to make this point, there's different kind of proposition types on uh, using knowledge bases. Uh, you know, um, you know we, we got like nine of them here. You got rules and facts. And you got axioms, theorems, conjectures, suppositions, corollaries, lemmas, and assertions. Those are all different kinds of proposition types that are stored inside of a knowledge base. So whatever is in the knowledge base is going to be one of these kind of things, one or more of these kind of things you see in this table here. Um, and uh, we use this, that these type of propositions to give our devices, our smart devices, the ability to think, right? To perform those operations that we talked about on the on the uh, in the previous slide, right? Uh, and so keep that in mind. These, these operations here, um, we use those propositions to perform these kind of operations. Just so everyone has that in, in mind here. And again, um, in our embedded systems, the knowledge base is stored on the Raspberry Pi, right? Okay. And what do we mean by agent? So we talked about there's an agent that runs on the Arduino, and we talk about there's an agent that runs on the uh, Raspberry Pi. Well, for our purposes and the development that we do, an agent is an autonomous, knowledge-based program, right? It is not something that is interactive. You're not going to be pointing and clicking uh, with a mouse to use it. This is something that is, an uh, you know, these are autonomous programs. The program that runs on the Arduino, those of you that are familiar, the minute the Arduino gets power, it just starts running whatever has been stored on it. Um, and on the Raspberry Pi end of things, um, we're going to be, we launched that Arduino as a part of System D with a System D timer or with a cron tab uh, um, scenario. So it, it runs at all times as well. And it runs immediate. And it's autonomous. So whatever it's going to do, it does that without your input or with very little input from you. Just enough to get it started. Okay, uh, and so the agent types, there are a lot of those out there. Uh, those of you that are hearing the term agent for the first time, you might quickly run to do a fact check on us and, and jump, on the, uh, jump on the web and see what you can see. And you're going to find out there are lots of different types of agents. The ones that are relevant to what we're talking about today, rational, epistemic, hyster hysteretic, utility, tropistic, and deliberate, um, those are relevant to the kind of agents that we're talking about today, um, but specifically the agents that we develop at CTES Labs are epistemic agents. Now, epistemic agents are basically knowledge-based agents, agents where knowledge is the, is the primary focus of, of the function of what that agent is. So we have epistemic highlighted here, and so if you really want to dig down deep and try to see what, what's going on at maybe the 
formal level or the conceptual level, uh, you might look up epistemic agents on Wikipedia or something. They might it might excite you in some kind of way. Uh, okay, and now we're going to give a, a, just a brief overview of the programming techniques. Try to give you a little more detail on it. Okay, so there are two C++ classes. One of those classes is going to be defining the Arduino sensor agent. The other is going to be defining the Raspberry Pi sensor agent. So keep that in mind. To do this programming technique concept, you have two different classes. One class runs on the, on the Arduino. The other class runs on the Raspberry Pi. The Arduino sensor agent is going to be a specialist. It's a sensor specialist. It's an effector specialist. And it's an actuator specialist. And in essence, that means it's going to have the dis models of the device-specific uh, uh, things that you have attached to your Arduino. If you've got a magnetic sensor attached to your Arduino, then your Arduino agent is going to be a magnetic sensor agent, and it's going to have a model, a, a C++ class model of that magnetic sensor. That's what this is referring to here. And on the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi is going to be an environmental um, specialist, right? And a measurement specialist. And, and I say that like, for instance, in one of our applications that we just did recently, uh, we did for Robot Week, we were measuring the salinity of soil, you know, how much salt is in the soil. And, uh, and so that Pi uh, agent needed to have a lot of knowledge about uh, soil salinity and measuring soil salinity. So it's a specialist in that regard. It also knows something about the sensors. It, it's a generalist in that specific sense. You know, and it's a generalist as, at the effector level and it's a generalist at the actuator level. Like for instance, to measure um, uh, salinity in the soil, um, any soil, and this could be soil in your front yard or backyard, you could use something called a conductivity sensor, electro uh, electroconductivity sensor. You know, you know how conductive is the soil in, in your front yard or backyard, um, and the the Raspberry Pi sensor agent generally knows what a conductor, a conduct, you know, uh, that a conductivity sensor is. It has a general knowledge of that. And uh, our Arduino sensor, in our case, we use something called a veneer conductivity sensor. The Arduino sensor had very specific knowledge of that uh, uh, veneer sensor. It knew what modes that sensor operated in. Uh, it knew what the voltage translation was for that um, uh, particular sensor. It knew what the slope and the intercept was for that sensor. It had very detailed knowledge of that particular uh, vendor sensor. Whereas the Raspberry Pi sensor agent it knew the function of a uh, conductivity sensor and what kind of readings you should get back from it and what those readings should mean. On the other hand, the Arduino sensor, it doesn't know what those meanings, what those, what those uh, readings mean. It knows how to get them, it knows how to be specific, but it doesn't have any uh, environmental um, or real measurement knowledge. The Raspberry Pi has that. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to see that as you get into this kind of a design. One of the agents has a high level knowledge of things and the other agent has the very low level knowledge of things. Also, um, you have a Arduino uh, sensor agent .h uh, file where you declare the class and a uh, .cc file, .cpp file for those of you that prefer the CPP. Uh, thing um, you define those two files and you and here's a point important point you put those in that Arduino slash libraries direct direct directory I have library singular here but that's libraries plural um, libraries um, directory uh, you do not put the class declaration and the class implementation in the setup and loop function that's just going to get you into trouble <laughs> okay so those of you that are beginning uh, just your beginners at the Arduino programming thing. I'm letting you know now you find the directory on your computer uh, that, has a, that has Arduino um, at, the, at the head of it and you go to the library's uh, subdirectory and then you create a directory for your Arduino sensor agent .h and .cc files. Um, and you will also have PySensor 
agent.h and pisensoragent.cc. You put those wherever you want. You know, that's, that's a, a Linux development environment on the uh, Raspberry Pi OS. And so you'll know where all of that stuff is and, and where to put it. It just, you want to put this, when you get to the Arduino, it needs to go in a certain specific place. Okay. Also, um, the, the, just dividing between the functionality between the, Raspberry, the Pi sensor agent and the Arduino sensor agent. The, the Arduino sensor agent, the member functions. Okay, so keep in mind a C++ class is a set of attributes and member functions. The member functions implement device-specific procedural knowledge. Okay, um, I do not have time here to define what procedural knowledge is, um, but it's the knowledge of how to. I can give you just a, you know, a brief kind of, you know, a quick, quick kind of thing, you know, like you know, the knowledge of how to ride a bike or you know, uh, how to jump a car, or you know, that, that kind of knowledge. Um, the, the member function on the Arduino class, they implement procedural knowledge. That's one of the reasons why we call it knowledge-based, because it has particular kinds of knowledge that it implements.